All right, we'll get started. You guys can. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the first Tech Talk of today here at the Redwire booth. Today we have a super interesting topic, and I can see you guys are all really excited about national security space. We're going to be talking about uh, some of the gaps and addressing uh, in architecture. So I am going to pass it over to our executive vice president of national security space here at Redwire, Dean Bellamy. Take it away. Thank you so much, Terry. Good morning. Hope everybody's having a great space symposium. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Uh, it is my pleasure to be on this panel and to be with so many distinguished colleagues here. And so let me take a minute. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, our panel format, uh, I'm going to uh, hand it over, let them introduce themselves uh, and talk for a minute or two about themselves. And then we're going to do some moderated Q&A. And then uh, at the very end, I'll try to leave a few minutes if there's any questions from the audience. So uh, first off, me, uh, Terry, did introduce I see so many friends uh, from my time in uniform or now here at Redwire in the audience. So great to see so many uh, great friends uh, out there. Uh, first off, the CEO of Exo Analytic, uh, Doug Hendricks here. And so uh, for those here on the panel, uh, and Doug, I'll let you introduce yourself. All right, so uh, like you said, Dean, my name is Doug Hendricks. I'm the CEO of Exo Analytic. We are a commercial space domain awareness company so we have a network of 37 observatories around the world, and that uh, comprised of 370 optical telescopes, 24-7 tracking of objects up in near geosynchronous, as well as medium Earth orbits and cislunar and beyond. And we also do quite a bit with Space Force Space Command. Uh, we work for the Space Training and Readiness Command, that's STARCOM. And I would like to announce today, if you look on Google, you'll see we sold our first telescope system to them. It's a Harrier system, as we call it. And it's used for training the Guardians in on-orbit operations. Woo so. Go Guardians. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. That's exciting. Uh, I would also like to introduce Tina Gator, who is the president of Minaric USA. Tina. Hi, everyone. Th Dean, thank you for having me. It's great to be here in this panel. Um, I hope you can hear me. Is this, is this on? Oh, okay. Um, Minaric is a laser communications company. We make la lasers cool. Uh, we're a product company, so we're deploying optical communication terminals in the space environment, so LEO, MEO, GEO, and above. Um, we're also equipping airborne platforms with optical communication capability and ground. Um, so when you're looking for secure, high throughput communication capability, optical is really the way to go. We're really excited to be part of several SDA programs on um, tranche one, um, also helping shape the standard for interoperability and communication. Um, we're in this hall, we've got a live 10 gigabit link of optical communication terminals from our airborne platform. So I welcome you all to come check us out and uh, look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Tina. Woohoo! Uh, we are also honored to have Dr. Andy Williams uh, for AFRL. He is the Deputy Technology Executive Officer for Space. So, Andy? Yeah, thank you, uh, and it's great to be here. So, at, at AFRL, this, the position that I'm in is a relatively new position, just to give a little bit of background. Right, the deputy TEO position was stood up with the stand-up of the Space Force within AFRL, really focused at how do we uh, go after problems not just of interest to the Space Force, but how do we go after multi-domain problems as well. Uh, there are problems that we need to solve from the air that only space can solve. There are problems from space that air can likely solve. And there are problems that, only, that are only going to be solved if we have both air and space working together. And so my position is really to focus on that space piece across all 10 directorates that we have at AFRL, developing the fantastic technology that the warfighter is going to need moving forward. And it's really focused on that delivery of capability, maturing it, getting it ready, going after all the illities that we need to worry in order to get it in the warfighter's hands on timelines that Honorable Calvelli is really driving the entire um, Space Force towards in the acquisition community. So three years from birth to orbit is, is a challenge, but that is where we absolutely have to go as a nation. 
Awesome. Thank you, Andy. I'm also excited to introduce a, a close friend of mine as well and a, a really terrific uh, professional in uniform, and that's Colonel Kevin Amsden. He is the Deputy Director for the National Space Defense Center for the NRO. And so, Kevin, uh, I'll give you the mic, the floor. Fantastic. Thanks, Dean. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, Long-time Space Symposium attender, first-time panel attendee, I guess. Uh, so it's good to be here. Um, I am representing, I guess, the warfighter, as Andy's talking about, of, of, at the National Space Defense Center. So I, am, uh, I lead the NRO element into there. And if you heard Dr. Scalise uh, yesterday talk about some of the things that the NRO is doing, um, he, he kind of announced that over the next decade we're bringing in four times the amount of satellites that we have on orbit in the next 10 years. We're, we're going to bring in, this is I know going to make Doug very happy, 10 times the amount of data that, it, that is going to be delivered. And so, so that's fantastic. And, and we're happy to share with everybody that, that we can. Um, in the National Space Defense Center, uh, obviously I'm a Space Force officer, so I get to work with our, our Space Force and Spacecom counterparts on the unity of effort. So all of that coming together for our Protect and Defend unity of effort. So it, it's an honor to, to work with all of the teammates. And if you'll hear uh, General Dickinson and Dr. Scalise in congressional testimony and every time that they appear together, they will talk about how the NRO and Space Command operate side by side each and every single day. And uh, the NSDC is where we get to do that. So it's an honor to be here. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Great job. All right, first question, really important one, right? We've all heard uh, and we've read about for years about architecture gaps. What areas, and Kevin, I'll start with you, for the National Reconnaissance Office, what are Dr. Scalise's priorities and what areas that you can tell us here uh, that, uh, that you're focusing on and the NRO's focusing on? Uh, sure. So. One thing uh, Dr. Scalise announced yesterday was a, a fourth initiative. He, he'd announced uh, three previous ones, and, and yesterday he talked about uh, a, a geoint, uh, commercial geo, so, or geoint, bringing in uh, data from anywhere we can. So again, we, we're happy to bring in everything that we can and provide it to all the users. Um, as far as the architecture, we, we also discussed that with 10 times the increase in data. That's a lot of data. Uh, and so we're working artificial intelligence, machine learning, AI, ML solutions, and, and that kind of the catchphrase for that is, is pushing the data at the speed of machines, right? So uh, yesterday there was a, uh, Dr. Scalise had some media engagements and was talking about how if we're relying on humans to, to tag, to move, to process, that that's, that's the, the short link, right? That's, that's the weak link in the process. And so we've got to speed that up, we've got to operate at, at the speed of machines, so with that 10, times increase of data, uh, working AI ML solutions that we can push it out to all the customers that, that need it in, in a timely and relevant manner. Fantastic, fantastic. Andy, AFRL for space, s and you know, uh, really you're at the pointing of the spear starting the R&D and the development to, you know, really evolve those uh, technologies into capabilities and architectures. What, what areas should we be investing in? Uh, so I would first like to piggyback on the machine intelligence, machine learning, the data fusion, all of those pieces, uh, because that's what we see coming. The number of sensors that are proliferating, the number of data sources, because it's just not on-orbit sensors. It's sensors that we're getting from aircraft. It's, sen it's data that we're getting from open source. There's a lot of information out there, and really as we bring in these autonomy tools and the machine learning, the machine intelligence pieces, we really have to figure out how do we accelerate the decision-making process on that? How do we integrate that into the workflows that the operators are used to? How do we build that trust with the, with the operations community? Because if they don't trust it, they're not gonna use it, so we have to engage with them from the very beginning. It's very much an agile approach that we have to go after with respect to those aspects. Uh, Beyond, bigger than that is how do we start integrating across multiple mission areas so it's not just missile warning data in a missile warning silo, it's just not PNT data in a PNT silo. There is likely information and useful content if we can cross flow that inf information, but we have to do it without overwhelming the operators. And then the last piece that I really, really want to highlight is how we enable potentially new capabilities that we haven't seen uh, so far. Things like space logistics that are growing, 
What does that look like? Uh, General Dixonson mentioned uh, um, dynamic space operations. That's a big piece of that. What can we do when, when maneuver is, is a key thing, a key capability that we have? Not something that we really utilize in space too much, so that's a key piece. And then the last one I'm gonna highlight is uh, new capabilities to the terrestrial domain, things like space-based power beaming. And how do we get power and energy anywhere on, the wor in, on, on Earth as needed as an on-demand capability just like you do with RF communication, right? You pick out your cell phone, you get, you get data wherever you're at. How does the dynamic change when power is as ubiquitous as that as well? Absolutely, great answer. Tina. Well, I'd love to follow on from what the gentleman just said. And I think, Kevin, you said it right. We're seeing the requirements for data grow exponentially. I mean, you know, 10 times the amount of data and more is, is required to be moved around to, to, to the warfighter, to the edge, to various nodes in the network. And that's where, you know, the products and the technology that we're deploying across, you know, the PWSA with the SDA um, is really coming into play. Um, this is no longer the boutique technology people were thinking about. It's real, it's getting deployed. Um, you know, we have to make sure that we're investing ahead of time. I know you mentioned, you know, where should we be investing? I think as a commercial company, we're saying, we're investing on our own. We're just looking forward to the opportunities where SDA and MDA and others are identifying requirements, right? So, and giving us the opportunities to spiral across, you know, three-year procurement cycles. So that really helps a commercial company invest on our own because we're really moving forward on a technology roadmap. And that's really going to help the warfighter. I mean, sensors, the data the sensors are collecting, you may not want to process everything in space. You may just want to move it across your transport layer or move it up to a different um, orbit. Um, and, and that's the resiliency you're, you're looking for, right? You're looking to be able to go across architectures. But beyond space, as, as you know, Andrew just mentioned, on the airborne side, you need to be able to move that data to the aircraft or to the forward deployed UAVs, whatever that is, you need to move that data. So your optical terminals in space need to be able to then transmit that securely. Um, RF is always going to have a place, but I, I think when you're adding optical, you're giving it more resiliency. You're giving a targeted, secure, high throughput communication to the warfighter. And, that, and that's what, we, what we're setting up for. That's fantastic. Doug, I will hand it over to you. Okay, I got a million thoughts in my head. I'll, I'll just give you three. Um, Kevin, um, I told him, I'm just going to say you need more data. And he came out and said 10 times. And I'm going to tell welcome. you. You're well, I'm going to tell you, you got to think bigger. More. <laughs> more. <laughs> think 100, think 1,000. 10, that's a good start. All right. All right, I'll give you that. Um, number number. Two, um, I, and I didn't see General Saltzman's uh, talk today, but there's a couple of words I, I don't want to hear anymore and that I'm starting to hear. Now, we started uh, Exploit by Build uh, was enacted about a year ago, and that was fantastic. I, th what a great change in attitude, and I think that's going to be great for all of us here. It's going to be great for the country. Um, however, um, a year ago they said we're not going to study the problem and admire it forever. And I'm starting to hear the language of studying the problem and admiring it. When I start hearing augment, find the gaps, look for ways that commercial could fill the gaps, keep innovating, and then we'll let you know when we find the gap. Then I say, I don't know if we're on the right track to fill those gaps uh, the best way we can with commercial. And all of us who are in this world know that, that we can do a lot of things that are not just a gap. And I would like to challenge our government folks to say, hey, think about ways that you can build us as a partner. We're mission partners. We're not just gap fillers. I don't want to vent, so I'll stop there. Uh, there's one more, one more word. I, not that I don't want to hear it, um, but you're going to have 10 times or 100 or 1,000 times as much data. Okay. And the commercial world is full of tools that are really best in the world. We've got some. Everyone in this pavilion has great commercial tools. And one of the barriers that I've seen towards adoption to commercial is the, it's the word vendor lock. And the tools that we're all building are so much more interoperable than you know in plug in, plug out, 
and we demonstrate that on the JCO, that's the Joint Task Force Space Defense Commercial Operations, and we bring people in, they go in, they come out, and their tools come in and out with them, and they seamlessly work together. I've never seen any vendor lock from the commercial tools that I've seen supporting the warfighter, and I think we need to think that there is another way, and I know the old way, there was a lot of vendor lock. When you went down a path with Lockheed or some of the bigs, there was vendor lock. I don't really see that as the same thing in the commercial world, and I'd like to change that way of thinking so we're more open because you're not going to process a thousand times as much data the way we're going now, and I think, I, I think that's something we can do better at. Um, I think I can echo that, and um, I, I think hats off to the Space Development Agency on all things, you know, no vendor lock. I mean, if you look at optical communication terminals, at the onset of Tranche Zero, the agency pretty much set out, you know, invited us all to help create a standard by which we're going to uh, become interoperable. And it was a mandate. You, you're going to get interoperable. Bring, bring your great ideas, all you commercial players. Yes, we know you should be capitalizing on all the investments the fiber industry has done and bring to the table the capability we need to move the, the large quantities of data. And this way, you are buying COTS components, COTS products, and you know three, four vendors out there that you can interchange on a satellite. You can mix vendors on a spacecraft and still be able to move that data around. So we're part of that team. We're a proponent of that team. And in terms of the large quantity of data, I'm, I'm with you. I think I think you know the more data we can move for you, the better. And uh, but one key thing is it's not just about moving you know the data. You know we can do 100 gig today, but we need to make sure some of the other value chain components on a satellite can keep up. Right, the crypto. NSA certification on the crypto needs to happen uh, at a throughput that we need. So there are some components that the commercial companies need to work on to kind of allow for the high throughput comps to go forward. Go ahead. Hey, hey Dean, if I, yeah, I could throw in, so just to alleviate one thing that Doug just mentioned. Uh, I don't know how many people just got to hear uh, the CSO General Saltzman speak on behalf of the Space Force, and then he was preceded by the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Honorable Kendall. And Honorable Kendall talked about some of the, the lag in acquisition process and a new initiative, a legislation that he's pushed forward that would allow them to get started on programs before the full congressional um, approval process and highlighted that, that need. And General Saltzman highlighted the fact that there was a GPS launch that took eight, you know, eight years from conception to go and how frustrating that is. So recognizing that, some, some new, uh, new legislation for trying to accelerate. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin, you and Andy both brought up our operations and the people who use this data, operations and training, and it's so critical when we look at these architectures, the users on the end. Can you both maybe just elaborate a little bit more on the ops and the training, and it really ties into what General Saltzman is asking for, Dr. Scalise and others. Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and start uh, on the S&T side. So, so we've got a couple things going on because our, our fundamental focus is how do we get the technology into the user's hands? Because the last thing we want is two things. One is that the technology uh, gets put in the Ark of the Covenant uh, storage facility at the end of Raiders, <laughs> yes. never to be found ever again, or that the data just falls on the floor, never to be seen, right? So that, that's the big focus. And what we've found as we work through initially some of the software focused efforts that we were doing with agile software and the DevSecOps approach is that we needed that integration with the operators from the very beginning, right? It has to be a full contact sport and that takes time and that takes effort and that takes a lot of uh, education on both sides of the fence because to be frank, Operators do not, speak, uh, do not speak technology, and technologists do not speak operator. It is like talking two different foreign languages. And so we have put a lot of initiatives in place to get operators working hand in hand, whether that's here at Catalyst Campus in Colorado Springs, out at Amos where we have a blended squadron between both DET2 and AFRL SMEs, and then we're also looking at the test and, and, and training and readiness and how do we take our capabilities, translate those to Starcom, and then how do we work on those next generations of technologies to accelerate really how, to, how we train future operators. Because if they can't use a tool, if they don't know how to use it, then it's not gonna be useful. And, and we're, we're seeing what, how important training is right now in, in the Ukraine-Russian crisis. 
And so our focus is on technology, things like synthetic uh, training. How do we bring in AR, VR, some of these things? We do a lot of work with our, our human effectiveness uh, directorate to really understand not only how do people train and learn, but how do we make sure that that is efficient as process so that we can really jumpstart people faster? Uh, that, that's fantastic. So picking up from, from there, um, I'll say, I'll reference, uh, General Saltzman gave an interview, uh, a Space Force Association interview, I think back in January, and he talked about what Dean was just mentioning, that um, the technology is half the equation. It's, it's, it, it can't solve everything. We have to have the operators. Um, here, I'll, I, I'm going inter to get interactive here. How many people have been to uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base? Okay, quite a few of us. So I remember as a young lieutenant getting there, I won't tell you what year it was, but I showed up and I went to the south base down to the, to the space launch uh, centers where they launch all the, the rockets. And if you know down on the south end of Vandenberg, uh, there's a place called Honda Point. Now it has a tragic history. It's a place, the worst naval uh, peacetime disaster. Seven ships were trolling down there. They thought they were in the Santa Barbara Channel and they ran aground, 23 sailors died. It, it, was, it was terrible. But here's an interesting thing going to what Andy just highlighted. New to the ship, 1923, was radio uh, navigation. But the sailors didn't know how to use it. The navigation officer didn't like it. He didn't know how to get a reading off of it. So they used dead reckoning and the tragedy ensued. And so standing there at Vandenberg Space Force Base seeing this, the fact that they didn't know how to use the technology that was delivered is kind of eerie, little foreshadowing of what General Saltzman is highlighting right now, that getting the technologies there, but he is so concerned about developing the guardians, teaching them how to do it, getting them ranges, training, with some of the things that Doug just talked about of how to actually do this. And then Secretary Kendall just talked about how the first space war, it, it, it hasn't been fought yet, right? When we, when we talk about Billy Mitchells and the World War II's, they, they had experience in air combat. We don't have that now. And so we have to train that. We have to have simulators. We have to do that so that we're prepared. And General Saltzman highlighted that the team that prepares the most will have the advantage when the combat comes. So a lot of times when we talk, and I want to stay with this theme of people, a lot of times we don't talk about the people and the organizations that are actually contributing and are critical to building these technologies that are addressing these architecture gaps. So if I could ask each of you to kind of talk about your organization, your people, and how they're contributing to really addressing these architecture gaps. All right, thanks, Dean. Um, so I'll tell you, EXO is a, it's an interesting place. Um, it's an odd place. Um, it was founded by me, who had never run a company or never thought he would. Um, I, I read a lot of books about the kinds of companies I want to be, so Apple, Microsoft. Uh, most recently, I've been reading a book about Google, and I decided that Google most represents what we are. It's a very free place. You're free to explore and find your place at the company. That being said, it can be a very challenging place. I'll tell you a fun story. Um, when we first got started, um, I, I may have told a customer that we were ready to track their satellite over Australia when none of us had set foot on Australia and we didn't, we had a site that we had negotiated but we didn't have anything there and when I said we have a site in Australia, I just meant we had negotiated a site, he thought we were ready to track his satellite. Um, his company was called Boeing and so that day I took one of our junior employees who today is our director of telescope operations and I said, good news, bad news, uh, good news, we got our first customer, bad news, you gotta get on a plane for Australia tonight loaded up with as many telescopes as you can carry on. So he got there and he got that thing, within four days we were tracking satellites. That's how quick we operate. Uh, but then we got our second customer. Our second customer was the Air Force Research Laboratory, hired us to track the Angels spacecraft. And it was about to make it over to Europe and we told him, hey, good news, bad news again. Uh, eventually you're gonna come home, I guess that's the good news. Bad news is you're going to France. But it's not the France that we all would want to go to. It's a mountain with nothing on it. And we were building the network as Angels was traversing the globe. We just had to stay ahead of it. And that's how we became a global uh, space domain awareness company. But it takes things like someone's got to get on a plane sometimes. And, and every employee at EXO has a story like that. Uh, and that, that's, that's how we got where we are. So I guess I want to say thank you to all of you out there. Um, I know it's been a challenge. And I did see a former employee who left us. Uh, he was one of our great ones, too. I see Brian Flewelling out there, another great one. John Rosano next. Julie Lawless, our newest Director of Strategic Business Development. Welcome to EXO, Julie. 
And uh, over I'd, to I'd just like to point out that Brian started at AFRL. Sure did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tina, talk about the great people who are actually making Minaric Technologies work. Oh, thank you. Um, some of the smartest people in optical communications are at our company, and we're a very international organization. Here in the U.S., we have about a mixture of production and office uh, capability focused on U.S. government programs. Um, one of the geniuses that makes me look good every day is Tim Deaver here. He's our VP of uh, Government Systems and Strategic Solutions, um, and he teaches me how to read uniforms every day. So um, that's Tim. Um, but the founder and CTO of our company, Joachim, came from uh, the German Space Agency. And he's really the brains behind a lot of the optical uh, communication capability globally. And you know, when we go to him with the problem of, can you move a couple of gigs of data, he's just like, are you, are you talking terabits? No, gigs. Um, so Joachim is um, a brilliant mind who has equipped tornado jets with optical comms and moved data down to the ground. He sat on a mountain waiting for a space link happen using optical. So whenever we have challenges to connect the nodes, um, we have some amazing uh, people. We have 40 nationalities represented in our company. Uh, we are in the US as well as in Germany where our headquarters is. Um, because we look at this as an international um, connectivity um, uh, issue. It's, so we don't see them as problems, but we know who our adversaries are collectively. We know who they are. And I think having a very international approach to things um, is really going to help us. If we sort of hunker down and start creating, you know, we have a standard here in the US, and if the European teams want to create their own, and we're looking for that resiliency across commercial and government networks, that's not going to happen if we can't communicate. And, you know, as I look around, I see a lot of different uniforms, a lot of international forces represented here, and I think that's the key to how we're going to be successful in the future and keep all of our warfighters safe. Sounds great. Andy, you know, in uniform and both now here at Redwire, I've had a chance to work with so many great people in the laboratory. And I say that across all the locations. And the culture and the people are really the lifeblood of that organization. And I just want to let you talk about the people who are really making these technologies come together. Uh, so that is absolutely true. Uh, it, it's probably obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. AFRL depends critically on its people. The reason why we are as successful as we have been is because of the phenomenal workforce that we have. We would be nothing as an organization without the culture and the talent that we have. Uh, and, and frankly, that creates some challenges for us in that um, we have to find reasons for people to stay that aren't purely monetary driven. Uh, and, and we do, and that is because people depend, uh, or they believe in the mission, they believe in what we're doing, but it's not just that. They believe in the culture and the people they work with. Uh, I've stayed at AFRL for 20 years. Uh, my 20th uh, anniversary is actually in June. Uh, but I, I, I stayed partially for the mission, but I really stayed for the people. It is such a community that we develop. Uh, it, is, it is a place that you will not find many places in the world where we have a mission, we have funding, we give people the creative license to go do what they think they need to do. We don't tell them that you're going to do this every day. And we allow people to be creative. It's hard to go to a meeting and not see you know, if, you know, doodles on a whiteboard uh, where we get into the details very quickly. We really look at that team, that teaming arrangement. We know that we can't do everything in a silo, uh, but we also know that we need everybody's big brains, right? We got people that have 15, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years of experience in any given area uh, in, in space. And so we really depend on that. And then we reach across the, the or other organizations into the, into, across all of the technical directorates to really build that multi-domain multidisciplinary way that we have to go after these wicked hard problems. And the thing that I really love is that we don't shy away from the hard problems. We're not trying to find the easy button, even though sometimes Space Force wants to hit the easy button. We know that that is an easy button to a dead end. And so we do get beat up as an organization because we're not willing to. And, and the people are willing to make that sacrifice to go after that because they know it's the right answer for the nation and they're willing to go after it. And it's really the people that, that it, uh, allow us to do that. So bring us the hard problems. We wanna go after them. That is what we are doing as a research lab. 
Uh, and then one last thing I want to highlight is the other hard problem that we have and that we're focused at is how do we build the next generation? And I think that's a big piece of the people part. How do we bring in through STEM education? How do we make sure that that remains a national priority and a national asset? Not just for AFRL because because we want awesome people come in and, and we want that diversity of thought, but we are gonna need that for the entire space community. And we really need to leverage that space is of high interest right now. And we need to use that at the, at the middle school, the elementary, the high school, the college level to bring in people to STEM and into space because I know that once they get the bug, they are going to stay. And I'd like to highlight uh, General Pringle Absolutely. taking over Space Foundation. She was not a space person three years ago when she started at AFRL. We have fully assimilated her into space in the last three years. And, that, and she loves it. And she loves AFRL. Go talk to her uh, at any time. Hey, Andy, agree with you wholeheartedly on General Pringle, and congrats on your 20 years. The next 20 years as a leader, really driving, you're going to play such a key role, and so thanks for really all your dedication and service to this country. Lastly, before oh. Kevin, i got to just say, uh, my time in NRO, uh, being part of the NRO OPNS family, shout out to Damon and my OPNS family, they were phenomenal, and uh, it's an amazing place to work. Great people, and I'll just talk about the people and the culture. Fantastic, and appreciate it. Um, hey, so I'm a Space Force guardian, and, and I'm an uh, honor and, and privilege to be a guardian. It's exciting to see the Space Force stood up, but I'll tell you, our, our nation did some, some really strategic uh, creation back in uh, 62 years ago by creating the NRO. We, we just, it was not as public and not as acknowledged what we did, but the, the culture that was started 62 years ago has provided the, the foundation, the bedrock of our national in, in intelligence or overhead collection um, for, for the entire time. Uh, you heard Dr. Scalise talk yesterday about uh, the, the uh, uh, innovation that the NRO crew force provides. Um, it's, it's a blessing that it's a, a joint environment. We, you know, people assigned to the NRO come in, they love the wicked hard problems, they love the, the technical experts that are there, people who have designed components for years that are still you know, working there and, and, and so they know the intricate details of, of how to improve and how to operate. So they, are, they love to tackle the hard problems. They love to take their background of experience and figure out how they can provide more data, Doug, more data, better data, more timely data, how they can, can, can execute the mission of the NRO faster and, and uh, improve things. So, um, and while I appreciate everyone's input here and, and, and plugs for their companies, I, I, I got to say, the NRO booth is right there. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I'd be remiss to say if you're interested in things that we're doing, you want to know why Dean loves his NRO time in the past, why I love my NRO time, stop by the NRO booth, pick up an application, just saying. Absolutely. And AFRL is just right over there, too. I'll give you a plug there, Andy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and NASA, which was another partner with Redwire, is right here as well. We're really privileged on that. All right, so I am going to ask you each a really important question. And, uh, and what is our definition of success? How do we address these architecture gaps? So it can be quick or long, but what, what is a, your definition of success? Doug, I'll start with you, go to Tina, and then we'll go to Andy and then Kevin. All right, I'll be quick. Um, we built EXO to be the most prolific um, trackers of objects in space. That, that's our mission. And success to us looks like the government has everything that we can do, and there is no adversary spacecraft that is ever not being tracked, period. That's it. Thanks, Dean. And honestly, success to us is to be able to serve the PWSA or other architectures that are out there and helping move data that's critically needed for our guardians, our warfighters um, out there, but also really kind of bring to bear to the requirements communities. Um, and, and they can be disparate ones out there that we have to interface with. Um, so we want to make sure we're saving all taxpayer dollars and bringing to you ideas and use cases in which our technology can really help with that mission of connecting the various nodes, space, air, ground, and really moving data fast. Um, so success to us is providing commercial, off-the-shelf technology that we've invested in 
and have shaped to really serve the needs of our warfighter. That is success. Andy? My, mine's pretty easy. My definition of success is there's never a space war. Period. The end. Awesome. Hey, I, I, and I'll second that and, and kind of combine that, um, that we have the, the uh, intelligence that we need to avoid, deter that, that situation. So as long as we can fix the architectural gaps, that we can provide the data that we need to in a timely manner, so the decision makers have what they need to make that decision to hopefully avoid that is a win. Awesome, love that. Uh, okay, so Doug, there was an announcement recently on something called Cerebro. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe elaborate from your perspective on Cerebro. All right, so uh, Cerebro is a concept that we hatched with Redwire. Um, and the idea is four pi steradians imaging of the area around a spacecraft. That's number one. And so when you do that, you're going to necessarily have smaller apertures. So you need to have the absolute best image processing in the world. So Redwire came with the apertures in a very clever looking design that I think you can look at at the booth. And Exo's coming to the party with the verifiably best image processing in the world. Um, what we do is we're able to detect objects as dim as the signal to noise ratio of three. So if I got too technical on you, okay, not. I'm sorry, but that is very good. Trust me. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to build the absolute best in-class system for observing all of this the all of the space around a spacecraft, being able to track everything, verify, know what it is, and perhaps even decide whether it's a threat. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. So Tina, Space Development Agency, work. I know you've mentioned SDA and the proliferated warfighter architecture. What's your thoughts on like how, how uh, is my, my art contributing today and how are things going? It's going incredibly well. And, and like I said, um, some of the, the work and the investments we're putting in, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that if it hadn't been for the Space Development Agency. And, and I also want to give a shout out to our friends at DARPA because we're working some great stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. On, DARPA Space Bacon. And yes, that's a great yes. collaboration between Redwire and Menorah, right? Yes, it's a fantastic collaboration. You know, this is where DARPA goes out there and says, yeah, we need a 100 gig terminal for $100,000 that's interoperable, communicates at any wavelength, go make it happen. Those are hard problems we know how to solve and we look forward to. So thank you, Redwire, for, for helping us. Just another quick thing on um, SDA. We, as a small company, sell to the prime contractors out there. We don't sell directly to the SDA. But the SDNA knows who we are because we, they're, they're at the same table with the prime contractors and they've invited us to that table. So the whole thing about training ahead of time, I see SDA program managers, the acquisition people, in meetings at the subsystem level, which is what we are, um, but on the transport, tranche one transport tracking layer, we're on several programs. Um, it's great to have the SDA team listen in um, witness some of the testing that's going on. Our, our teams right now are at NRL doing um, interoperability testing, so um, all's, uh, all's going well, as I hear, and uh, that's going to become a, a great milestone, which then you know continues the uh, to support the SDA vision on this spiral development in this sort of three-year period. Um, that allows us to keep investing and producing the tech that can help the future. Absolutely. So Andy, I would be remiss if I didn't look kind of over your shoulder at your nine o'clock and I see rollout solar arrays. And that's one of two technologies that Redwire has been able to work and mature and actually make operational because of the commitment and the people at AFRL. The other one is uh, Link 16 antennas, right, with XVI. And really, those are just two examples of technologies we've been able to partner with AFRL and be able to mature into an operational environment. Um, I know you have other operations and other things, but you've just had a recent reorg. Do you want to just share for a few minutes kind of uh, in this new role and, and how y'all are going to be focusing a little bit in this new organization? Yeah, so the, the thing that I want to really highlight is that uh, AFRL is a little bit novel when it comes to how a government research lab operates or a research lab, lab in general. We don't really do a lot of uh, only AFRL research 
in an academic kind of environment. We are focused on partnerships. Almost every technology that we have transitioned has been in partnership with an external organization. Whether that is with uh, industry, whether that is with universities and academia, it is almost always a partnership. We are dependent on that, and that's largely because that's how we accelerate transition. If, if we build it in AFRL and we haven't talked to anybody about it, um, then when we finally unveil it from behind the curtain, it, it takes too long for us to transition. So we use a lot of partnership opportunities, things like ROSA, uh, which I helped, I helped, I participated I in directly. Isn't it exciting to see it? It, it is. I mean, it's amazing. It is fantastic. Uh, but that was that was really started as a as a small business innovative research effort. That was an SBIR, and and we leveraged that capability, and we built that partnership over time. Uh, we leveraged some of the technologies that we had um, developed in house uh, through IP, and 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 most of the IP that we develop is available to almost anybody in the U.S. Um, we we as a government entity, pretty much all taxpayers have access to it. And so we really work on that partnership piece. So we stood up a new strategic partnership directorate within AFRL uh, because we know how hard it is to work with the government. We, we realize that. AFRL is a complex organization. It, it's hard to find the right touch point. Um, so we've done a few things. Uh, we have created a front door that, that doesn't go to the uh, black hole of the internet. It actually goes to people. Uh, it gets sent to uh, various folks within the organization. We created a strategic partnering directorate so that people have access, whether you're a university, whether you're a company or a startup or you're a prime, you can reach out to us. And then the last piece I really also want to highlight is the role that I have within AFRL, uh, in addition to kind of integrating the space technology across AFRL, is to be that single point of contact. So if you don't know who to reach out to in AFRL, uh, reach out to me. Reach out to uh, the mission area leads that we established within AFRL. Uh, but if you don't know who they are, like I said, reach out to me, and, and I, I'm usually pretty easy to find. Andy, that is really revolutionary. And what you're doing, we're going to see in 30 months or less new technologies coming out of AFRL really to support the warfighters. So thank you. General Saltzman has really, Kevin, I'm going to, my last question to you. General Saltzman has got a lot of initiatives, a lot of energy, things that he's trying to drive home. Is there one message you would like to share with everybody that's really um, to kind of echo what General Saltzman's philosophy? Um, first thing that comes to mind is, again, just coming out of, of uh, his speech just a few minutes ago, um, he, he praised and, and uh, appreciated the innovation nature of, of America, right? Uh, the, across industry, across the military, across all of our partners um, as well. Uh, but that innovation, um, and so he, he had just talked about pivoting to focus that the old way of doing things, the old architectures are not going to be sufficient. Uh, we, we have to pivot to address the challenge. Obviously talking about um, China as a pacing threat and how we have to you know, basically up our game. Um, but he was confident in the innovati innovation that is provided across the industry, across the military to reach that challenge. So I, I think that's what I would echo here is that everyone here is for that reason. And, and his, one of his final points was, you know, not, not one of us is stronger than all of us. And so we, it needs to be all of us coming together to solve that, it. That is an excellent message. Uh, for us, as for the planned questions I have for us to end on, because that really encompasses what we were really trying to address on this panel. But I may have time for one or two questions from the audience. So let me uh, come down here for a second. Uh, what is your name, sir? If you could introduce and then ask your question. Okay. Hi, I'm Shane Dykeman, Colorado Space Business Roundtable. Dean, I love the panel with commercial industry and government, but the dark side question. The government is famous for self-inflicted roadblocks, risk management framework, cyber maturity model certification, classification processes. And a great case in point, about a year ago, Shai John 21, ExoAnalytics has a YouTube video about the rendezvous proximity orbit in GEO. I talked to my guardian friends and they're like, can we talk about that? Can I mention that outside of the skiff? How do we overcome these self-inflicted roadblocks? Shane, is that a Marine uh, logo? Uh, thank you for serving and wearing the uniform and being a Marine. Um, first off, right, I will just say this for the panel. I'll let them answer uh, the question for where they can. Uh, you know, it's a, probably a whole of government question on that. It's not just one organization or one agency. It's everybody that's going to have to do it. But I, I will ask if anybody would like to address that or not. I, I, I would. <laughs> Looks like it. 
Hexa rocks. I, I don't know this man, but I was about to reach in for my wallet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so that, that was an interesting case. So um, at the time, we were under contract with the Joint Task Force Space Defense Commercial Operations to track that object. What had happened was they were not, they were only buying a fraction of what we have to bring, and that's when I said, Kevin, uh, success to me looks like you're not buying 10% of our capabilities, you're buying 100%, and maybe it's not you, but somebody is buying 100% of our capabilities because when that happened, 10% wasn't enough. I, I had to authorize the entire network, had to go searching for that thing. And that's what it took. And just maybe a joke, but I think that cows and California poultry farmers would agree, buy more chicken, buy more commercial data. <laughs> okay. Does anybody else have a response? Uh, hey, I'll, I'll say, uh, yeah, I'll go and say, second that. Uh, and and um, we've heard multiple speeches about uh, infusing commercial data. Um, last night, uh, Master Gunnery Star Sergeant uh, Stalker talked about one of his favorite things was, was commercial geoint because you avoided that classification and you can give it, give it to people. Um, I'll just say, if you didn't catch Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, uh, John Plum, ASD Plum talked about this exact issue uh, you know, being addressed and we've heard from General Heighton, we've heard now at the ASD level, uh, you know, trying to tackle it. So um, great fodder for, for the discussion and, and you know, commercial geo helps, you know. Dean, um, the types of things that we've seen is, you know, the government may put out really easy contracts like other transaction agreements to kind of get through to make it simpler for smaller companies to transact. Um, but we've got this middle layer of prime contractors, right? Um, when we receive a request for proposals from people, they have teams of 70 to 100 that are responding to this big proposal effort. We might have three to five people, right? I, I, I resemble that remark. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what we would like to see is, you know, some simplification. And if there are some very hard uh, terms and conditions being passed, um, the flow downs that are required to be passed down from the government to the prime to the little guy like us, um, that's fair. But I think there's some things that can be and should be. And I know the government is asking some of the players to... Um, really simplify the process and as you mentioned general Sultan said that basically it's not business as usual anymore we can't operate like that we've got to operate faster so we fully endorse that uh i would like to thank our my distinguished hosts and friends first uh, doug hendrick ceo of exo analytics tina gator president of minark um here in the u.s dr andy williams uh, from AFRL, who is the Deputy Technology Executive for Space, and my friend, Colonel uh, Kevin Amston, who is the uh, Deputy Director for the National Space Defense Center for the NRO. Thank you for your service to the country. Thanks for all the work you're doing, and really thanks for all of your uh, time con today contributing on this panel. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Thank you, Dean, for hosting us. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.